North Dakota Legislative Review. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. Our guest today is Representative Al Carlson from Fargo. He is the House Majority Leader. Your second time on the show this, this season. You bet. We made that promise that uh, we'll get through halftime and we'll head towards the third period of the game and we'll talk again. Yes, and we were very close to the third period of the game as committees are finishing their work on bills with, with a few exceptions. They're getting to the floor and then you're, you're getting them either concurred with or immediately sent to the governor or some conference committees. So what's the status of that? Well, you know, we normally you'll probably have uh, about half of the bills that we pass will end up with some kind of a change and, and you take a look at them and say, yeah, we agree with it, we don't agree with it. This time we're going to, I think, have a, many, a lot fewer uh, conference committees than we've had in the past. I don't have a good reason for that. It's just happening that way that the legislation has passed through. Uh, I will also tell you, though, that most of the big issues are still out there laying on the table. And what's dominating this whole session is still money. I mean, we're, we're struggling to find a way to balance this budget without adding, you know, we had a chance for more fees today and we didn't do it. You know, it, we're just trying to not add any tax burden onto the citizens and downsize government to the point where it, it lives in its means. Uh, everybody says, well, you know, how can I survive these cuts? Well, most of these budgets are going back to an area where they used to be, and most of them are not even a full-fledged cut, they're a reduction in some of the increases they had. And the market has changed, and our need for people and programs out west has changed somewhat. So there's a reason to do this. A, a reset is a, is a pretty good exercise for any government to do. And the reset is to the 11-13 biennium? Yeah, that's pretty much where those numbers are going to settle out. Uh, there's exceptions to that. Public safety, quite obviously, uh, the, the growth of the prison population, uh, the issues that we faced out west with that rapid enrollment, some of those things, some of our DUI laws that required more than normal incarceration. All those things we're looking at, by the way, to try and figure out how we can rehabilitate people without putting them in prison. So in terms of maybe money, but some of the other issues, where are the major potential sticking points at this point? Well, I think that you're going to find that, uh, that we've got issues like, uh, oh, the western area water supply is a big one. Uh, the uh, state taking over county social services is a big one. Uh, I think that an issue that we need to address is the self-funding of our insurance uh, plan for our employees. Um, those are probably the highlights. This whole uh, lake bed minerals issue under Lake Sakakawea has been, they're working on that hard. Uh, the marijuana bill, trying to get that right so uh, we're providing what people thought they got in the measure and that is a very safe product uh, that's a medical type of, of uh, medicine actually that helps people with various uh, diseases. You know that's not easy. Uh, all, a lot of these have emotion locked into them so you've got to address those issues but overall when we get all done uh, some of those don't have as much money as they do have policy but in the end it, we've been working hard to try and figure out how to balance the budget and even on the best case scenario today, we're still got to find over $100 million to make it work. But that's, that's what's shuffling things all around uh, on the table. And again, we'll, we'll get that done. I've been here 13 sessions. Every time we've balanced the budget, some of them were lean years, some were fat years with cash, and, the, and it's no different. We've got to figure out a way and then go home. So the $100 million you're talking about right now is actually better than it was at Crossover. Right? Absolutely, and that requires some moving of money around. Obviously, there's only a couple big pools of money out there. Other than that, it's just every budget is going to be between 15 and 20 percent less, except protecting K-12 and protecting a lot of the human services, especially the nursing home area and that. The rest of them are all going to take a 15 to 20 percent reduction. Uh, we're getting a lot of pushback on some of the higher ed reductions. Uh, that budget's still a work in progress. We have it in the House. And what we're trying to do is figure out and make sure and offset the fact that when we reduce revenue or, or dollars that we fund into higher education, that that isn't all in turn put on the back of the students with higher tuitions. Yeah, and there's a lot of, lot of discussion about that, and there's been some demand from at least a few college presidents that you don't put caps on tuition. You know, there are certain programs where we're under the market, you know, whether it be our medical program or our law degrees or even at our aerospace. There are a few of those that are below the market nationally for those particular degrees. But on the other hand, um, we're looking for efficiencies here. And that's a hard word for them to say. In most college institutions, there's, they're looking at their, their structure of their hierarchy. 
and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, people employed in higher education that are not directly instructing students or not directly involved in research and they need to take a look at that we just have to tighten our belts since you mentioned tightening your belts and you did mention at one point your proposal about self-insurance for yep. health insurance uh, I think that's still in committee correct it's in committee I'm gonna be I'm gonna go address the uh, Senate caucus next week and we're going to talk about it so they all understand what it does. And that's a real step forward because we need to, uh, uh, these tremendously big increases that we've been facing on health insurance, part of it caused by the ACA uh, and other parts of it that are caused just by the, the way the plan designs and things are. But we need to be the risk taker here and we need to be the risk rewarder if our, if our uh, premiums do not uh, or exceed our claims that money should come directly back to the state of North Dakota. We can add more wellness factors into this. Uh, 49 out of 50 states are in one version or another self-funded. We're the only one that's not. And we need to look at that. We need to do it. it needs, it's, it's a new concept. Uh, we, we're getting some blowback. The public and, uh, employees, for example, think there's something funny in here and that we're going to cut their benefits and somehow we're going to give them less than what they had. And on the contrary, for the next two years, if we do this, they won't see one bit of change in their policy. What they have today, they'll have tomorrow. It's just that the risk will be on the state level and the rewards will also be on the state level. So it's a, it's a change in, in how you do business. I can tell you there's many successful large companies and organizations around the state that do it and they're all very successful and none of them have ever gone back to fully funded when they've been self-funded. You will still have to hire somebody to manage the fund. Yeah, absolutely, and it's more than likely the same people that are doing it today will be doing it tomorrow, because they have the claim, they have the all all, all the paperwork set up for all of our. And by the way, there's 68,000 individuals that are served by our policy. There's probably 17 or 18,000 policies, but all the, when you add up all the family members, there's 68,000 people that receive coverage under this plan, and that is a big deal. And we don't quite honestly, you bid that out for the uh, third party management, you buy risk insurance for catastrophic loss, and then the state who, who couldn't can't afford to be in the position to handle this. And in the future, when you save money, you build that reserve, you don't have to raise your premiums and much, and it saves the taxpayer dollars on that program. So it's a great idea. I hope we get it done. Is it hard to explain, though, to the general public? You know, it's not if they have it. You know, Governor Burgum really disagreed with us on the health insurance premiums. He wanted us to take away 5% uh, and have a 5% contribution by the employee, which would have also, by the way, affected the legislature. The House would have done that, I believe, but the Senate was not, they thought it was the wrong time, it was too late in the process to do it, and we agreed and said, you know what, if you're not going to do it, we're going to cross all these budgets over, and they're both going to be different, we're never going to get to the end of the road here. Now, so we didn't do it, he still believes we should have. Uh, he comes from a model where it was 80-20 at Microsoft, and we didn't look at that. Uh, this whole ACA thing blowing up at, in, in Congress, we have no idea what that will mean to us on Medicaid expansion, a lot of the things that that, uh, that that has had as requirements, you know, grandfathered clauses. We're paying a 2.5% Obamacare ACA tax because we're a fully funded plan. And if you're self-funded, you don't pay the 2.5% goofiest things are in that thing when you start digging into it and in the end it's the taxpayers dollars it's not our dollars and we it's our responsibility to guard those but with the ACA going away are you worried that maybe the new American Health Care Act might change that well I think it'll change that and that's why we we're hopeful to spend some save some days so that we could come back and if we need to and the governor can call us back but between the waters of the USA and the Clean Air Act and the ACA and a new president uh, uh, in, in President Trump, there could be a lot of things that, that we need to address in the next two years. It'd be nice to have a few days to do that. Um, I'm not sure we'll need them. I don't, I, I'm not as optimistic as some of these congressmen are that they're going to pass this and then the Senate's going to take it up and pass it. I think it's a long process. I think six, eight months from now we can look at changes and uh, whether they're going to block grant Medicaid expansion, I mean, and whether we'd apply for that. Or those are all big decisions that are way too early to predict, but I think in the end they're good for North Dakota. We manage our programs better than somebody else from up above telling us how to manage them. So the idea is still to keep as close to 10 days as possible. We're trying to do that, and you know what? The sooner we get into conference committees, the sooner those budgets come out of committee, the sooner we get those established. From the time they say the last bill goes out, 
uh, and, and you set up your conference committee, it's a minimum of two weeks before you could ever close the doors. Well, if you look ahead and start counting, a lot of people are hoping Good Friday. You know, I, that'd be a great thing. I'd like to see us do it. We're gonna, it's our goal. Um, but a lot of things have to fall in place by Good Friday to make it work. Dominoes or puzzle Absolutely. pieces, perhaps. Absolutely. Uh, I did want to get into the medical marijuana just a little bit because your name is on the bill. Absolutely. The leaders are on the bill. It's gone through one house already. The Senate has passed something, but now House, House Committee's got it. There are more amendments coming on. This is a very complicated issue, and, I, and maybe it may be more complicated than we realize. It's an extremely complicated issue, and I got involved in it from the day, the day it passed. I called counsel. I said I needed, a me I needed to get a meeting with the health department and with the attorney general's office to see what it says and whether or not we can make it work. Well, first of all, you have to understand that it's a, an illegal product federally. It's a class one drug, which means there isn't a doctor that, that wants to keep his license that can write a prescription. It can only be, it, because it is illegally federally, none of the product can be raised outside of the state and none of it can be sold outside the state. It's all internal in the state of North Dakota. And it's a cash only business, so there's a whole list of guidelines the banks have to follow if they want to handle any of the money from the transactions. So it's very unique in how it's set up. And uh, I, I was adamant from the first day, and I still am, about the smoking. I th think that recreational side leads to all sorts of problems. And uh, I'm in favor of the, the medicinal side of it. If we're going to have it, let's regulate that. So it's not easy. The amendments are more clarification. In my opinion, some of them were micromanaging, where people are trying to make sure they're not liable for anything by by listing all the different diseases, by listing all the different chemicals that could be in the product. And the list is never ending, but we're trying to get them all in there. So we've got some issues to deal with on that. Uh, I do think it'll come out uh, of the House, and I think we will get our two-thirds. There's a few people that say, just kill it, let them live with what they have. Because in a measure, they forgot to decriminalize it. And when they forgot to do that, basically anybody that touches it would be subject to uh, uh, federal law violations and state law violations. So our bill decriminalizes it uh, very controlled from seed to, to distribution. We will know everybody who touches it, everybody who dispenses it, everybody who uses it, we will keep track of. And with that in mind, I think we've got a good bill. And it's complicated, but it's a good bill. Senator Larson from Minot is talking about allowing, you know, people if they're, if they're quite a ways away from a distribution center or a grow center, to allow them to grow their own. That doesn't sound like it. that's on your... That will not happen. On, uh, I will not support anything that allows independent growing of the product. They, today they call that illegal growing of the product, and it still is. Because then you have no control. When they worry about kids having access to it, you allow independent growing of this product without regulation, and look out, it's going to be a lot of smoking by people who shouldn't have it and don't need it for medicinal purposes. This is not wide open recreational marijuana. Colorado made a huge mistake. I don't know how if they ever can figure out how to fix it. But when you go out of that state, it's a, it's a mess. And uh, we do not want that in North Dakota. We do want, though, though, if little Janie who has epileptic seizures, if this has proved to help her, then we want to make sure it's a safe product of the right potency that when she takes it, it actually does some good for her. And that I think we can accomplish. What about the fees that are charged in that bill? Well, it's a money loser for the state. The way it's written, we lose money setting this whole thing up. And it takes time to set this up because right now we don't even have seeds. And then we've got to grow it, and then we've got to have the dispensaries, and then we've got we to process it. We've got to have it tested. We've got to make sure that it's safe, and it's got to be in whatever pill or liquid form. Um, I don't know. I, I think we, it's just going to be a process. It's going to take time, and I think we'll get it done. Do you think it's one of the tougher bills that you've had to tackle? Well, I think in order, the people come in and say you're overriding what we voted for. Uh, and I still maintain that what the people voted for was medical marijuana to help this little girl I talked about or some guy with chronic back pain that, that just has no, or Crohn's disease, that has no other, other uh, pain medicine. But scientifically, if you go to journal after journal, it'll tell you there's not enough scientific research on this product to tell you that it'll actually provide what you think it's providing. We made sure that our committee didn't get to have any edible uh, samples when they were especially going to vote. <laughs> well, I, that's, a, that's a good uh, segue to something else. And 
Uh, the issue of the Department of Transportation might be kind of a hidden issue because there were the eight uh, garages for for some of the heavy equipment that are going to be closed because yep. of that. DOT actually brought that up. It wasn't the legislature that brought that up, and that's caused a little bit of consternation. I guess the your your house, one of the appropriations subcommittees, is looking at that issue. Yeah, and of course, one of the uh, the chairman of that subcommittee happens to have a couple of them in his district that that they want to uh, close. Um, they've had all kinds of ideas. Give them, give those buildings to the counties. Uh, in some cases, the counties want them. In some cases, they don't because some of them are in disrepair. Uh, I mean, they've been holding sand and gravel and lots of things in them. It isn't like they're a brand new Butler building sitting on the corner. So uh, I'm not sure where that's going to go. We again ask them for efficiencies. Uh, all we're asking them for is what kind of service and how far can you, it's like a, how long can you put on a kid on a school bus? How far is this snowplow away from where the roads he has to maintain if you close all these sections? Is, is, are they strategically placed? Uh, and, and in the end, hopefully we'll find out that we can have less of them and be able to maintain them better and have uh, better facilities in those areas with less of them. Another issue, of course, is water because there was the idea of what people call the tax on water, a, sub, a, a surcharge on water, and that goes back to the WAS issue versus um, some of the independent water dealers. Um, where is that going to shake out? You know, we ju I just had a meeting with a, uh, some people on that before I came over here. Uh, and right now, uh, our WAS contracts have dwindled to a, a fairly low level. The water we're selling through WAS, way below where we thought we would be in terms of, of uh, selling. The trouble is that our rates are too high compared to the independent water users. We need to become more competitive on our rates and sell more water. But if we don't address something on this, we're going to be at a stage where uh, the state's going to be taking over some real bad debt. And we don't want to do that. So we're trying to figure out whether there's a lot of options on the table. Uh, I'm not a personal fan of, of having bonds and uh, long-term uh, loan forgiveness or postponed payments and then accrue interest on them. So we've got to, we've got to look at how we get more water sold and, and make that a viable, uh, make them a viable competitor in a market where when it started out, they were prepaying their loans and now they're way behind. And we've got a big chunk of change, $160, 70000000 million sitting out there between between loans and grants that we've done, and we need to make sure that's protected and not written off. Because every dollar we write off there, we take away from somebody else's water project. So we got to figure it out. So bonds for that or bonds for anything else off the table right now? Well, I wouldn't say off the table, but I don't like the idea of bonding. We just need to, to pull our spending in this time and find ways without raising taxes and without bonding. Because all a bond is, is is spending future money. And uh, we've tried really hard to get out of that. Since I've been leader, we haven't bonded had a few revenue bonds for things, and that's different. They have a source of repayment. Uh, but every bond you issue on WAS, in the end, the state of North Dakota is, and the good faith and uh, credit of North Dakota is on the line before you're done. And uh, we need to figure out how to make them sell more instead of bond more. Is there money in the Water Commission budget, enough money now for the FM diversion project and also Minot flood control and some flood control projects like in Valley City, places like that? Yeah, th the good news is that the buckets still fill. You know, we have designed so our, our uh, excise tax is divided so it goes into various buckets in the general fund and, and it goes into water, it goes into education, it goes into infrastructure funds. And those buckets are going to remain. So even if the price of oil is low, we're still filling those buckets and the, wa and the money is there. Uh, we're taking a lot closer look about money that's been set aside and not spent for projects. And we, and if unless they have a plan to meet for immediate use, that money get, might get moved around a little bit. But our water, because of the fact we set it aside, those projects are going to continue. Now, speaking of setting aside money, th there's still apparently some discussion about uh, impact aid, oil impact aid. That's probably one of the biggest buckets of money out there. There's a hundred million dollars that we've been issuing in, in impact grants. Uh, the way uh, Representative Delzer and I look at it, we think that that number should be about $25 million and the other 75 is going to have to help us uh, get out of this budget situation we're in. You know, we have the property tax relief fund, $300 million. Uh, there's a commitment for $275 million of that in the bill the Senate passed us on us taking over county social services. I have some real issue with that bill. I mean, whenever they build a bill with hold harmless cars and automatic inflators, and we don't control the employees, which, by the way, there's about a thousand of them. Uh, I have some real issues of how we're doing that. 
I don't disagree that we need to uh, take a look at those things uh, and con consolidation of those services. But to just jump into this with a, with a, we fought hard to limit property tax growth, and now to let that go out there with automatic flaters and the state eats the dollars is just not right. So that's still a work in progress. That's a work in progress. We're trying to figure out how to make that work. And quite honestly, if we can't make that work, my recommendation would be that we do not do it this time. And you stick with the 12 percent. And the 12 percent is what's set aside. There's, we're a little short because that had part of the allotment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at about 275, 280 million will be there. And that should be, in my opinion, returned to the property tax owner. But if we can find a way to get out of that and to do takeover services of different types, where we have total control of how that money is spent and it actually does lower your tax bill, then I can support it. Uh, but we're not there yet. Well, here's an off-the-wall one, and that, that is the Senator Cook's bill about taxing Internet sales. It, it's in your uh, House Finance and Taxation Committee right now. It's in the bottom drawer. <laughs> it's in the bottom drawer. It's in the bottom drawer in the tax committee. Um, South Dakota did the very same thing, and Senator Cook is very involved in the Main Street Fairness Act, which sits in Congress. And South Dakota, uh, one of their senators down there is extremely involved in that. They passed this very same idea that we're going to tax everybody. And it was struck down within weeks by the, uh, by the courts, saying until Quill versus North Dakota, which means you have to have nexus in the state, is settled, you cannot go out and tax everybody that sells something into your state. Now, I've been trying to find a way to get voluntary participation. Um, very difficult because 50 different states, 50 different taxing mm -hmm. uh, ideas is very difficult. Um, so we're trying to find a way to make to soften this, but I think just to create another lawsuit that we're going to lose until Congress does something is just not right. So it really, if Congress would do something, this would be a lot easier. Well, if Congress did it, then there's no question. They would. We could easily just say everybody that sells into the state will collect tax. Period. And then, then you can look at a uniform system so these big companies. And it, quite honestly, if you go to eBay, you go to Amazon Prime, and you go to Walmart, you're probably going to pick up 70% of the tax paid on products that are sold into this state. Now, we're collecting on Amazon because they have a distribution site in Grand Forks, but their discussion has been to turn that into a service center, a calling center, and therefore they wouldn't be liable for uh, paying our tax. But they have been collecting it, I understand. So at least that's that's helping. The situation. It helps. You know, I know it, sales it, tax is a real issue. Yeah, Main Street business, and of course they come to see me every time another J.C. Penney or a Sears closes, or West Acres Mall loses another retailer. They stop in and say, "Look what's happening. We're dying here." And I agree, it has an effect. But when something is not going to be uh, ruled as, as being legal until the federal government changes, I don't know why we chase our tail on the issue. And I understand that maybe South Dakota may appeal theirs to. Oh, the I'm sure Supreme they'll appeal, court. but they're going to lose because that is that is the Supreme Court law of the land. The nexus rule still applies. From Quill versus North Dakota, yep. which was back way back to Heidi Heitkamp days, yeah, yep. when she was Attorney General. I yep, believe. that's right. I'm not sure she takes credit for that or not. I haven't asked her. Here's an odd one too. Uh, there was talk about a 100 million dollar ending fund balance. The leader in the Senate saying maybe we'll have to get by with 50 or 60 million dollars. Is he right? You know, he's. Yeah, we're going to have to get whatever we can get. I just won't leave with five million. That isn't even. I mean, that doesn't cover us for half a day. So we might as well not even think about numbers like that. You know, it'll be what it'll be, but it shouldn't be any less than 50. It should be 100. But again, it'll be dictated by what we're able to move around in these budgets to get it to balance. Again, it's a cushion. It's it's a fail safe. Absolutely, and it keeps us out of coming back. And the biggest thing about the underlying of all of this is to get the process where our revenue projections are more accurate so we're not back here in another allotment situation like last August. Because quite frankly, we've used up our reserves. And we are even we have to be extremely cautious that we're not taking next time money spending at this time. Or taking money from 1921 that we anticipate coming and rolling it back into our budget in 1719 because that will always come back to bite you later because you need to raise that again. So in a very brief capsule, how do you change that process of forecasting to make it more accurate? Well, I think that I've always maintained, uh, I'm, I'm a legislative branch guy. I think that we have separate functions as government. This time the budgets are legislative budgets. 
you know, the, the governor made recommendations. We, we're crafting the budget. We look at his regimen, as recommendations to add them in. We also need to do the same thing with the budget forecast. We need to be able to hire people that we want to give us revenue numbers. We need to have establish a full-time revenue committee that meets quarterly like employee benefits and the other ones. And we need to be engaged from the very beginning. Uh, and I think what the advantage that we have is that we put much more credence on the local guys. You know, the boots on the ground analytics are the best we can get. Every time I've listened to them, we've been much more accurate on our, on our revenue forecast. When the auto dealers and the implement dealers come in and the bankers come in and the ag sector guys come in and the energy guys from coal and oil come in, we're much more accurate. When they talk about their hiring plans, we know what we can anticipate for, sale, for income tax and for sales tax. And when more rigs are counted, we know we're going to collect 75 or 200,000, whatever it is, off of every well that drills. So those guys are pretty accurate. We max them with, up with some of the federal macro things. And I think, uh, you know, some guy who has a worldwide view of things to be a, an outside consultant, I think the legislature can do an excellent job of getting an accurate revenue projection. Thank you. Our guest on Legislative Review, Representative Al Carlson from Fargo. He is the House Majority Leader. For Legislative Review and Prairie Public, I'm Dave Thompson.